Central bank money is determined by the Bank of England. It is not chosen or fixed by the central bank, as is sometimes described in some economics textbooks. It is sometimes overlooked as the main way in which money is created. This is, in fact, the fault of the economists who have taught actually everybody else on the planet a false model of how banks actually operate. Virtually anybody who's done an economics degree has absorbed where the supply actually comes from in this market for loanable funds using supply and demand curve. Unfortunately, the model is wrong. Now, I've been saying that it's wrong for my entire academic career. I'd never expect neoclassical economists to listen to critics, let alone critics who are also economists. And then the Bank of England, much to our surprise, came out and said the critics are right. Without Without exaggeration, American debt is a ticking time bomb. Well, in many of my videos, I criticize Elon Musk for making statements like this one here. If this continues, I, the government running a deficit and therefore accumulating more government debt, America goes de facto bankrupt and all tax revenue will, will go into paying interest on the national debt with nothing left for anything else. Now, in this video, I want to show why this is a mistake, but it's not a mistake that it's Musk's fault. This is, in fact, the fault of the economists who have taught him and virtually everybody else on the planet a false model of how banks actually operate. So I'm going to start from comparing two models here, both developed in my Ravel software. And in the top one, we have the situation that is taught by the textbooks. And in the bottom is the situation that I say actually applies in the real world. Let's watch them two running at the same time. Now you can see in the top one, GDP flatlines. There's no change in GDP over time. There's a rising level of government debt to GDP. And in fact, that's rising exponentially. The debt of firms to the economy is rising linearly, but there's this exponential rise in government debt. Equally, there's an exponential rise in interest payments by the government already after 50, 60 years of simulated time. We've got interest payments being 20% of GDP. And if I run it through the whole way for 100 years, interest payments exceed GDP. So there's absolutely no way that that system is sustainable. If this was describing the real world, we'd have to make sure the government never spent more than it took back in taxation. Otherwise, catastrophe awaits, as you can see. Now, down the bottom model, well, rather than GDP flatlining and then declining, GDP rises exponentially. So does the amount of money in bank accounts. The level of debt rises and then stabilizes. And so does interest payments. And they stabilize at relatively trivial levels of GDP, 1% down here versus 200% up here. So there's something very, very different between the two models. And what's that difference? In the top one, I'm running a model that's based on what economics textbooks teach everybody is how banks actually operate. And the crisis that they fear occurs in that model, even with a tiny deficit. Now, what's the difference? Well, the top one is based on the model called loanable funds. And now let's take a look at a couple of economists explaining this model, like this one makes a video to explain how the real world works according to economic theory to, to unsuspecting punters in the real world. So here we go, because we have the market for loanable funds and there must be supply and demand curves. Now, since the loanable funds market is a market, you already know it's going to have a demand and a supply curve. So let's listen to another uh, typical economist explaining where the supply actually comes from in this market for loanable funds using supply and demand curves. Yeah, really important. Uh. There's more to the supply than just individual savers. The supply of loanable funds is made up of private savings. That's savings by you and me, but there's also public savings. That's the money that the government has left over after paying for all its expenses. So the supply curve is made up of both private savings and public savings. And that brings us to the question that you're most likely to see on your exam. Show what happens on the loanable funds market when the government increases deficit spending. I'll give you a few seconds to figure it out. And he gives you those few seconds and then he goes on to his conclusion. There's two ways he makes a conclusion. One is that there's an increase in demand with no change in supply. But the one that he says is more realistic is that there's a fall in supply caused by the government borrowing money that would otherwise be lent by households to firms. Let's this video whetted your appetite for an approach to economics that is grounded in reality rather than the fantasy assumptions that mainstream economists call simplifying assumptions, then consider signing up for my seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. In just seven weeks, I'll teach you what I've learned in my 50 years of fighting for realism over delusion in economics. You'll also get a copy of my proprietary software, Ravel. I call Ravel the monetary telescope. Once you've seen the economy through Ravel, you'll never think in terms of static supply and demand diagrams again. You'll get Ravel as a bonus inside my seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. To apply, go to stevekeen.com and click on Get Started Today. So 
That's the lesson that virtually anybody who's done an economics degree has absorbed, and the vast majority of them, unfortunately, believe it because the model is wrong. Now, I've been saying that it's wrong for my entire academic career. I've been preceded by people like Joseph Schumpeter and Irving Fisher, who made the same cases back in the 1920s and the 1930s. People like Basil Moore, who made it in the 1970s, and we've been ignored. And that, that's what I expect. I'd never expect neoclassical economists to listen to critics, let alone critics who are also economists. And then the Bank of England, much to our surprise, came out and said the critics are right. So here's the Bank of England in 2014 in its quarterly bulletin, saying that banks do not simply act as intermediaries, lending out deposits and savers place with them. But that's what the textbook tells you is actually the case. And that's what these YouTube economic experts are emphasizing as well. Banks don't use supply and demand curves to say how much money they're going to give you. They use double entry bookkeeping. Now, if you go back to the 19th century, when the supply and demand model was first invented by Alfred Marshall, there were no computers. There was no way to simulate uh, as we can do these days. But with modern computing tools, we can build a model that uses double entry bookkeeping, which is what banks actually use to do lending, and then see what happens in that model and see whether it compares to what the supply and demand model tells you. So what I've done in this model where the crisis occurs is I've modeled the idea of loanable funds, and that's shown in this table on the banks, showing that what the banks are doing is simply operating as passive vehicles through which savers and borrowers can interact. So there's nothing being done by the banks themselves. Uh, they just enable firms to pay workers wages, workers to buy goods from firms, and then there's all the borrowing going on. So firms borrow from households, so money transfers from the household accounts to the firm's accounts. Firms then pay interest back to the households. Uh, the government taxes households and spends on firms. Uh, and then because it's required to by law, the government issues bonds that are equal to the deficit if it runs a deficit plus interest on existing bonds. Those are all those transfers there. And the only way the bank really can make money in this system is that they've got to be charging a fee, an intermediation fee, for introducing savers to borrowers. So I've modelled that, that uh, households pay a fee to the banks proportional to the amount of interest that they're being paid by both uh, the firms and the government, and then the banks spend back on the private sector buying stuff from firms. So put that model together and you'll notice one thing which is missing. All the financial flows turn up in this model, but there's no sign of the debt. Now, why is that? Well, effectively in this model, since the banks aren't doing the lending, the debts have to be an asset of another body in the system, not the banks, but the households who are the ones doing the lending. So if you take a look here on a combination of the bank's view and the household's view. Here's debt. The debt of firms is an asset of the household sector, and the debt of government is also an asset of the household sector. And as I've shown you, when you simulate that model, you end up with a complete crisis with the model of loanable funds and what banks actually do. Because banks are not intermediaries, banks actually originate both money and debt. And it's very easy in my Ravel software to take that situation and then say, well, it's not correct that the debt of firms is an asset of the household sector. The debt of firms is an asset of the banking sector. And the same for the debt of government. It's not true that the government banks are the private banks. The government has some accounts at private banks, sure, but mostly at banks at the central bank. So if you look at what the central bank does in the model of loanable funds, it does, to use an Australian expression, bugger all. It's simply there's reserves there. As you'll notice, there's nothing happening on the reserve column over here in the model of loanable funds. So there's no role for the central bank. What I've done in the bottom model is I said, well, it's not true that households are doing the lending. Banks are. So, so the debt of firms and the debt of the government both turn up of assets of the banking sector and the households are just basically paying taxes, consuming and being paid wages. Far less dominant role than they have in the model of loanable funds. Uh, the Bank of England in the, in the real world model has a lot to do because the spending by the government goes through bank reserve accounts and that then turns up on the asset side of the banks and they then are required to put that money into people's deposit accounts and so on. Interest payments, the same thing. That's a transfer from the government's account at the central bank to reserves and taxes work in the opposite direction and so do bonds. So that's the simple changes between the two models. Now, once I've done that,
we can now simulate this model. And what we find, as I showed earlier, is there's no crisis. There's what happens in the real world model. That's what happens in the textbook model. Now, the textbook model is simply structurally wrong. And it's wrong in multiple ways. So one is, as you saw from that ACDC economist I showed earlier, is that a surplus actually increases savings in their model, whereas a deficit reduces it. So when you do the double entry bookkeeping, that conclusion is completely reversed. The deficit actually creates money by putting more money into people's bank accounts than it takes out in taxation. So rather than the supply of loanable funds falling because of the government running a deficit, the supply of money increases because the government runs a deficit. That's how complete this transformation is. Now, I know if you've been fed a diet of supply and demand diagrams in your economic education, then it's very, very hard to accept this real world version of what actually happens, which gives you the opposite conclusions to what textbooks have taught you. So I read a little cartoon book to try to make this easy to understand called Funny Money. This little cartoon book explores the adventures of three very wealthy Americans who've had enough with the situation and they decide to create a perfect world in which the money supply remains constant. Of course, there can't be inflation if the money supply is constant. They think this is going to be absolutely wonderful. And then I go through the double entry and show what actually happens in this model. And let's just say the conclusion isn't quite what uh, Tom, Dick and Harry think is going to occur. So if you want to understand this cartoon level, first of all, and then build up from there, apply to join the online course that I'm now teaching, which is www.stevekeen.com. You'll get a copy straight away. Now, if you do sign up for the course, you'll learn how to think about the economy as it actually is. It's a dynamic, evolving monetary system of production. It is not a pair of intersecting supply and demand curves which reach equilibrium in all markets. You'll also learn about the role of energy in the economy, which is something else that mainstream economists completely ignore. And when they do try to take it into account, they get it just as wrong as they get the money market in model of loanable funds. You'll learn how firms actually set prices. And that also has nothing to do with the dissecting supply and demand curves. And you'll get a copy of Ravel, which is the software with which I built these models so you can build the systems yourself and see how they function. Now we have the tools today to break away from the crib the totally false supply and demand model that was invented in the 19th century and should never have left the 19th century. So join me in the 21st century and you'll join a lovely bunch of people who've already signed up for the course here. Uh, and the discussions I find fabulous with all these people who are enjoying finding out how the economy really works rather than living in myth world. Like many other truth seekers, I want to learn 50 years of real economics from me in only seven weeks. You'll love my new seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge as well. To apply, go to stevecane.com. If you qualify, you can attend my lectures, ask me questions personally every week, and make friends with a great group of like-minded people. So again, like many others, go to stevecane.com to apply as well for the seven-week Rebel Economist Challenge. Good luck.